Data storytellers, welcome on the new episode of the podcast. It's an exciting one. Um, it is going to be a conversation with Kate Gooden. And Kate and I have been in a conversation for a while now, I think over a year. And she joined us for one of our master classes. She brought a lot of value to the conversation. And I, know, I want to share the value with the, with the whole community. So Kate, welcome on the show. Thanks so much. So first, as we always start these uh, sessions. Um, the audience would love to find out a little bit more about what shaped and molded you as a professional. So how did you get in the world of analytics? Maybe that's a good way to start. Sure. I feel so lucky to have gotten into the world of analytics because for many years, I think I wanted a career that put all of these pieces together and I couldn't find one. Um, I was always interested in using data uh, rigorously. I liked science. I liked math. But I wasn't willing to give up working with people, uh, solving problems. I liked working on new problems every day. And I always felt kind of limited by that. So um, I ended up in economics for many years. Uh, I worked for the US government in DC. I was an economist, uh, spent many years thinking I might uh, want to pursue that for a lifetime. And I ended up starting over in tech. And as soon as I got into tech, somebody kind of realized that I could put some of those data skills to work in, in the analytics. And uh, I've never looked back. Um, I feel so lucky that I got to combine data, people, problem solving, and then learning so much about the world of business in a career like this. Hmm, that, that makes sense. I mean, it doesn't need to be a contradiction you know, science and people, but it's, it's, it's funny to me that, uh, you know, after you went to DC to work with people, you were like, look, I have to, have to go to tech now. <laughs> <laughs> that's where you found the, the actual meaningful engagement with people. So that's exciting. Actually, when you and I started speaking, I think you were still at Expedia, right? So that was your previous role. What did you do? What was your role at, at Expedia? I started working for one of Expedia's many brands, uh, it was called Homeway at the time. And they had grown up in Austin, Texas, where I'm located. They were in a great point of transformation. They had been acquired by Expedia and were moving um, to a two-party marketplace that Airbnb had spurred them on to make the switch um, in the vacation rental space. And so I got to partner with um, some new leaders on the marketing side to build out a marketing analytics function for them that really kept pace with that transformation and that move to a marketplace. Um, from there, I spent years at Expedia in different jobs. I realized when I had to do a resume, I had had five totally different jobs in five years, um, all with the same laptop. So uh, there was a lot of room to try different things um, because they had so many brands, so many transformations, and so many business challenges to solve. Got it. So when we talk about those challenges, I think you're already alluding to what we're going to speak about later with the experimentation, but uh, uh, what was the, uh, like, if you had to identify the edge of the knife in data analytics over at Expedia, like how, what was the main approach to trying to create business value? And of course, I'm not looking for company secrets. It's more like the challenges of you as a data analytics practitioner. Where, where were you guys looking for growth opportunities? I mean, it was fundamentally that the data had gotten us that had gotten us to a really successful IPO and to really a market leadership in the market was never going to get us to the next phase to keep up with a brand new, you know, app first product like Airbnb. And so the biggest challenge was we have all of this data that we can't be precious about because actually we need all of this new data to solve this big new challenge for this business. Uh, on the marketing side, it was how do you compete in you know, a space that Google wanted to share at times. Um, certainly, Airbnb and Booking were very competitive in. But everywhere in the business, we had to really shift our mindsets to be able to say, we thought we had a great handle on data. Now we need new data and definitely new approaches to be able to use it to drive insights um, in this really newly competitive marketplace. Hmm. Oh, you guys definitely did a good did a good job because I just recently I think switched over from checking my flights on the Sky Center, Sky Scanner, and Google, and now I'm an Expedia user. I'm not affiliated. There's no like discount Expedia discount code in the in the podcast. I'm just letting you know that you know whatever 
work you did there, it had at least like one fruit of, of me being a commerce. So. <laughs> well, I do hear it. There are thousands of people working every day to make those apps better. Okay. Well, well, you definitely did your part. And then, uh, well, you moved on uh, from Expedia. So uh, uh, what are you doing now and, and what's your mandate in your new role? Yeah. In my new role, I'm working as a head marketing analytics for Miro. Miro is a great uh, visual collaboration tool that is is really more than the whiteboard product that we started with. Um, we're bringing teams of people together to solve problems, which is something I'm really passionate about in analytics anyways. I actually got into Miro because I was working on some, uh, at Expedia, my last project was to try to do a big data transformation, basically implementing some of the data mesh principles. And we found ourselves in kind of a mess of uh, schemas and architectural diagrams that Miro helped us untangle. And so um, when I had the opportunity to make a move and, and work on Miro's pro product itself, um, it was a no brainer for me. It was really exciting. Hmm. Yeah. And actually, um, I knew I heard about Miro uh, before me and I started talking, but then I looked into it more as well. And I saw that that's a very exciting opportunity. And I know that even during the masterclass, you're like, I've, I, I know that you guys are no vendors, but a lot of times I was. I felt like compelled to say, just use Miro. And I said that it's no problem at all because you know our no vendor policy is, is for the data solution providers. And Miro is more like a collaboration tool and a very good one at that too. Again, no affiliation, but uh, I actually started using it. So we're using it now with the team. Um, it's great for brainstorming ideas. You know, For me, it was immensely useful to identify organizational structures. Again, we're going to talk about experimentation, but as you're going through growth phases, like it's just so important to have clarity on, on on what you're doing, and you know, having different iterations, different ideas. At least for me, it's uh, you know extremely useful. It's the next best thing, or maybe even better than the good old fashioned you know pen and paper. Because I'm still see, it can't let go of this. There's something you know magical about it. But now the next stage is is, is, is the Miro board. So, um, at Miro, so um, maybe we can actually talk about just your the masterclass experience in the sense that people were telling you or you got feedback and I got feedback that people really enjoyed your perspective on one particular aspect of change management. Uh, what was that? I found myself speaking to these great analytical leaders who were talking through how do we provide impact to the business? How do we move the business for, forward? And so often I thought, you know, based off of a lot of my experience at Expedia, could you just set that up as an experiment? Could you use an experiment to try to come closer, not necessarily to the final answer, but to learn a little bit more? And, and to me, that was always the, the great thing about experimentation was when you're stuck, sometimes experiments can really help you get some additional insight on some of those hardest problems to solve. Um, just by learning a little bit more and progressing your your knowledge um, incrementally. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and actually, why uh, this is so cool that we're having this conversation now because I've just finished like a short course with uh, Matt Lerner, a great guy. He used to be the the uh, head of growth marketing over at PayPal, and uh, it was a short course. And one element was really how to instill a culture of experimentation, and the angle was that at any kind of startup, small company, and as an analytics function, you are a company within a company. Anyway, so the same principles apply. Uh, the thesis there that's backed up by a lot of real life experience is that first of all, you always like, choose a North Star metric that is based on customer value. So that's the, that's the one thing that you align everybody uh, on the team on. So whether they are, in your case, you know, data scientists or working in other other sides of the analytics uh, operation, you align everyone around that one metric. Now, everyone contributes to that metric in a different way. And then you identify some of those levers, some of those growth levers, and you do experiments around it. And the experiments, uh, they also need to take a lot of boxes. You know, you don't want theories, you want hypothesis or hypotheses uh, specifically. And just you very aggressively make these bold experiments in short growth uh, spurts. And it was very inspiring to me. I mean, we've been kind of doing that anyways. And I always found it super important to also uh, overcome organizational insecurities that I think people can have when you're trying different things. It can really fuel your growth. Um, but basically, over your career, how 
have you found, and we can also like zoom in on the details, but maybe just big picture, like how have you found yourself kind of developing your framework of instilling a culture of experimentation? Definitely. I mean, to me, it was it was really an aha moment when I started working for the first time in an online tech company like Expedia, which is where experimentation is second nature, that I had this moment of like, I don't have to come to the business and be right the first time. I can I can add value to this business just by helping them understand some of their biggest opportunities, understand what some of those North Star metrics are, and help us together put together a learning agenda and a plan to try out new ideas where some of those ideas might come from me, but oftentimes the best ideas are going to come from people who are working in this business every day, the operators, the business unit owners, and you know everyone on the team. And it was just such a breakthrough moment for me that I don't have to come to you with the right answer the first time to have credibility and to be an important part uh, of the team as your analytics partner. I need to help you figure out a way to test what works, learn from it, and set up another great test on and on so that we're always learning a little bit more. And so that was something that was really modeled for me um, at an experimentation first company like Expedia, where you know uh, Expedia had, had this as part of their DNA. HomeAway had to add it in as we moved through that transformation to being a two-sided marketplace. And so part of my my role there was, how do I take some of these best practices from an online tech company, bring them to a business unit, and really show how powerful a culture of experimentation can be to bring the best ideas in from all over the business? They don't have to come from one or two people. Mm -hmm. And let's just maybe explore and let's sell sell it a little bit in terms of uh because it makes a ton of sense to me in general and i know again the master class attendees who are like top analytics leaders in, in some of the biggest companies in the world and they found it very very inspiring and applicable like your approach but from your experience and even having those conversations at expedia it was second nature but then why do you think what what can a pain does that solve if you manage to instill this culture of experimentation with the right frameworks? I spoke with a colleague of mine who had actually uh, left Expedia and Homeway and gone to um, a company that, despite being a tech company, didn't have this culture. And she pointed out to me how much she missed it because without this type of culture, you end up in a well-intentioned, just bury it mentality. When things don't exceed expectations, when projects or initiatives don't just go wildly successfully for any sort of reason, leaders have this tendency to say, I don't want to demotivate my team, so let's just not talk about it. And and so instead of burying it, this is something that, that she just remarked upon, in a culture of experimentation, you're really using all of those basics of a growth mindset to say, I don't know the answer yet but I probably learned something valuable, especially if I set up that project or that initiative in a way that win or lose, you know, exceed expectations or not, I'm guaranteed to learn something. And as long as you're learning something and putting that into the next initiative you're doing, you're always going to make more progress over the long run than doing one big bad idea and either you luck out and it succeeds uh, beyond expectations but most of the time, uh, it doesn't, and you're happy to have learned something. Absolutely, and I remember that you know during my my, my startup career because we had a, another venture too um, back in the day in Europe, um, data leaders. And I remember the first time I really encountered the utility of this is when we had like a huge, huge initiative. We launched it with high hopes, and it was a majestic failure. Like went down like the Hindenburg. Right. And I remember being like genuinely happy and I couldn't figure out like, like, why am I so happy about this? And as we regrouped and debriefed on it, it was just such, such a revelation to know that this did not work, especially when we looked close and understood why it did not work. 
it provided a whole different perspective on the entire journey that we were having, right? So it's not about coming up with these huge ideas and then making sure that, you know, whatever happens, we push it through sometimes, you know, trying to like smash a square peg into a round hole. Uh, but no, we are going into one direction. We try to reach this point and, and the journey will be rough, you know, and sometimes you just got to know which ones are the dead ends so that you can find the quickest and best way to that destination. And we really built on that also. So, you know, also at the data storytellers, uh, whenever we have a failed experiment, that's fantastic. Like that's mission accomplished, you know, with a fail, with a, with a failed experiment. It's all about what you do next. So um, I think we're going to have visibility on the issue itself and, you know, why it can be so important. So let's say you're a data analytics leader and you don't have the benefit of that culture. The, you know, you're not surrounded with that. It's really not the modus operandi. So what can you do? What would be what would be your first steps as, as a leader to instill that? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a strong believer that as an analytics team, we are uniquely situated to be champions for experimentation. And, you know, many companies bring experimentation in through different ways. You can do a top-down approach from the very beginning, Oftentimes in, you know, tech companies, you're getting this from a product manager, um, possibly even an engineering group. But from an analytics perspective, we're one of few groups that really ties together data science, data science, plus, you know, understanding business drivers and business outcomes in great detail. So I'd say the first place to start is with yourselves as an analytics team. And start to think through what are some experiments that we could run today in in an analytics group with one of our business partners where we don't have huge dependencies. Modeling this behavior to start get get started on building culture is so important to me. So I think about, you know, what experiments can we run today that don't actually need a big tech lift? One of them that is a favorite of mine is for sales or customer support teams to really think about. How can we look at all of the accounts that we serve? Is there a way to pretty quickly split those into test and control groups and the data that we live and breathe every day and just go out with a new playbook or um, a new chat solution to a group of those people from the very beginning? As long as we've got a clear hypothesis, we can probably do some of those experiments just within the analytics team without a big heavy lift. And, um, you know, I'm also a big believer in letting other companies do some of the heavy lifting for you. In my world of marketing experimentations, you know, ad platforms have a very vested interest today to really bring experimentation tools online. The old ways of being able to track users across the entire internet and um, use cookies are going to continue to erode. So there's a ton of experimentation tools that you can use out of the box on ad platforms. As an analytics team, you can add credibility uh, to some of your business partners by truly understanding those, even if you're not running it end to end yourself. So no, this is great, especially uh, I liked, I loved what you said about, uh, okay, you maybe you want to look, but you don't have huge dependencies. You want to do something that doesn't require like a huge tech lift and you mentioned hypotheses. So what is the difference between a theory and a hypothesis? You know, this is a hardcore science, but so consequential to how you engage people. In this. this is a fun part for me. When I started having to teach other people about experimentation, I was like, I need to go teach you a little bit of like intro to the scientific method. Um, what is a null hypothesis? But basically, we're looking for something that we can test. And we're looking for something that we're going to add the outcome of this experiment. We're going to be able to, um, you know, test our null hypothesis. And, and whether or not you're, you, you know, you've got a ton of background in science or not, you know, even school kids know how this works, right? You just need to be able to say at the end, can we confidently, you know, reject our null hypothesis? Versus, you know, to me, theories are, are just ideas that will never, you know, likely know the outcome one way or another. And, um, and, and they can be an important input into this kind of discovery process, um, whether it's a theory or a business strategy. But really, this work of, uh, of building out a hypothesis for me is always about narrowing and simplifying 
over and over, can we make this any narrower, any simpler, any, any, you know, any ability to be able to say, I feel certain at the end of this, that we got a, to an outcome, either it worked or it didn't. And, and that's where a true uh, great hypothesis can be really powerful. Can you give an example of like a good hypothesis, like any, it can be in any kind of hypothetical business or, or a real one, B2C, B2B, and like a, a realistic data science and analytics scenario? Yeah, I think that one of the places that um, we we tend to jump ahead in analytics is we want to go all the way straight to revenue. Um, you talked about, you know, let's get those North Star metrics and what could be better as a North Star metric to say, I'm going to test something and I'm going to see if it drove more revenue. And really, when you're trying to build out a hypothesis for, um, you know, something in your business, say it's one of these, you know, sales plays that a new sales team wants to pilot um, where they've got a, a, a new lever um, or possibly a new product to launch to talk to customers. Going all the way to revenue can oftentimes be extraordinarily prone to bias. And that intuitively makes sense. Every salesperson knows uh, by the time you end up closing a deal, there's going to be so many different ingredients um, in, in signing a contract. So trying to work with them to come up with a hypothesis of something that you can confidently measure that you know is at least correlated, if not hopefully has some sort of causal outcome on that big uh, North Star metric or revenue metric is hugely helpful. So I want to test a hypothesis, say, that rolling out this new sales play to half of my customers, for example, is going to drive an increase in whatever the next step in your pipeline is would be a much more solid hypothesis, right? We can at least see that direct relationship. And so it may just be um, my ability to qualify a lead. It may just be the ability to set up the next meeting. And sometimes I think this can be discouraging for people when they're starting out on an experimentation. They say, well, that seems so small. But um, it's an important piece, I think, for an analytics team to then go back and say, we're going to try to at least quantify the opportunity from that initial metric that we feel really confident about testing and some of those downstream metrics. And you can also think about having primary metrics and secondary metrics. A primary metric I'm always going to encourage your first thing that you're testing in your hypothesis is very easy to observe. You can size, you're going to have a direct outcome. But a secondary metric, you won't call the test a success or a failure based off of it, but you can widen the scope a little, widen the aperture to try to say, maybe that's where you're going to bring in uh, a higher impact metric, maybe not all the way to closing a deal, but you know, grow, increasing a, a deal size or pipeline in the room, something like that. Absolutely. And yeah, this is such a good point because, um, as you said, uh, I mean, it comes from a good place, the desire to, hey, let's just impact the bottom line. Data needs to be business focused. It needs to be an impact there in the revenue. It's like easy to show. But um, sometimes when you jump the gun, again, you just miss out on those huge opportunities. And guess what? Like you can use storytelling to actually connect those things. So let's say if the single thing, because overall, as you said, the revenue will be impacted by so many things in that sales pipeline. How many how many sales conversations will the reps have? You know, what is the percentage of conversion from one sales stage to another? You know, uh, uh, what is the conversion at the very end? Uh, as you said, the single purchase amount and all that. Now, if you just target one of those and you can get a clear improvement, it's actually like a way more compelling case that you can say that look, we changed this one thing, this metric. Uh, 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 elevated this metric rose very clearly. It's like the whole idea of of correlation uh, does not mean causation. While well, in this case, the hypothesis is set up so that it's pretty clear, and then you can just weave the story, and that resulted in that uh, uh, increase in the bottom line, in the revenue at the end. So it's kind of like a storytelling move that you can use to to jump from one to the other, and then really show the bigger impact of that small change that you implemented. So that's great. I think we, we have then basically we went from just identify an opportunity somewhere where you don't have huge dependencies, don't choose something that has 
a huge tech lift and then isolate a hypothesis where you can change something very clearly with not a lot of effort. What about the time? So, so um, with these experiments, um, in the timelines, um, are we looking for something like super long term? Are you doing like short bursts? Like what is your approach to experimentation in that sense? I think I think the next step is definitely for you as an analytics leader to start modeling out how experimentation becomes part of your culture when you're building out what I'd call a learning agenda. Because success is not running one experiment. The whole point is success is running multiple experiments over a roadmap and learning iteratively and quickly. And so what I'm really looking for is how can we get the shortest experiment that has a meaningful outcome? We're learning something, it has to be something meaningful, but it has to be fast enough that we're able to quickly iterate and move on to the next experiment. And at the very beginning, we can have a bunch of hypotheses to put together experiment after experiment after experiment visually and show how that learning agenda builds over time. And so that's where a, a place that I think analytics leaders can add a ton of value by listening to their business partners and their internal clients and saying, those all sound like great ideas. Let's add that to the learning agenda. Let's put that in our backlog of things that we can test and then show how you can connect these tests over time. Another key piece here is um, being able to show that the rest of those tests should be dependent on the first one. Based off of what we learned in this first test, we're going to take what we learned and then start to build out some decision trees. If we learn that what we're doing is hugely successful, we're going to go on and try to possibly scale it more. We'll have more iterations. We'll see if it works in another market. If we learn it's not successful, that's okay too. At least we learned something before we did all that scaling and expansion. And now we're going to iterate and try to find root cause after root cause of what's going on. On the losing side, like I don't tend to go through if it's not successful, here's our whole agenda. But I think showing that visually is really powerful for um, business partners to be able to see that we're not talking about one experiment. We're talking about a whole roadmap. Hmm. So it's almost like a tree, right? It's like a learning tree that uh, you keep growing. So a, a quick question on that, like how do you actually get people engaged in this learning agenda? How do you sell the learning agenda? And I don't know, maybe your playbook has that step later on, but I'm just, I just feel compelled to ask. Yeah, I think the early step for me that's been really powerful has been, you know, t take a small test and then really try to model oftentimes pretty publicly what I learned. And I think this is where in the culture of experimentation, humility plays a huge role. Being able to connect with your business partners and honestly, like, explain that I had a hypothesis that this was going to win, right? I was felt really strongly and man, it didn't. But look at what I learned. For me to be able to model that as an analytics leader so that other product leaders, other engineering leaders, other sales leaders see what that looks like. It sounds a little mushy and, and soft skills, but that's been a big piece for me. Um, we had some rituals in the in the early days at Homeway and Verbo that were very public, where we would go through lots of experiments publicly. And you know, one of the best parts of that experience for me was being able to see that you know you could talk um, about your learnings and some losses and get some, ideally you're gonna have an executive sponsor who's gonna back you up and say, you know, great, we're glad you learned now and what's what's next with a real focus on, on what you're gonna learn in the next experience. So I really try to focus the the narrative there on, on what's next. So you mentioned that oh, it might sound a little bit mushy and soft skillsy, the whole humility thing, but I think it's one of the most useful, applicable, actionable things you can have. So, because it just helps your credibility so much if you go with that. Because people can smell out the kind of insecurity when you just stick to your guns, whatever happens. Even if they, do, if, if they don't recognize it consciously, they will label you internally as someone who has an agenda and you just can't let go of that. And in fact, this is how you can, because if you, Sometimes we feel like, oh, I proposed something, it did not work out, so I need to kind of defend myself. 
But if you do the exact opposite, it's kind of like in a bar fight when you start throwing the haymakers, right? It's the exact wrong thing, but you need to do is exactly the opposite. Like lean in and pull your uh, uh, hands up. Not speaking from experience, but uh, the, 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 the point being is that the exact uh, opposite is you would do of, no, 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 like where does the badge of honor that I proposed it, it did not work. And here, here's me acknowledging it. And here's what we learned. And it will really put people at ease on your next recommendation. They will, they will know that they can trust you, you know, that's, and then the, the trusting it's another, one of those soft scales things that people throw around, but again, super, super useful. And, and here, the actionable nugget is that in your communication, just like lean into these things and throw them out intentionally because it will definitely help you in the uh, in the long run. So that was like another piece here then to approach it with um, uh, humility. Um, and it, but it will definitely help you to sell the idea too and then resell the idea. Quick question again, you might talk about this later on in the playbook, but uh, you said that, oh, we might put just the idea in the backlog. Um, I don't know if we need a segue on agile. It just came up in the previous couple of conversations. So, you know, maybe I can ask that it, do you use some sort of framework like agile to, to properly navigate and keep these experimentations on track? Absolutely. I think that, you know, when you get to a point where this is a well-oiled machine, particularly if you're working with, um, product managers, engineers, and folks where agile is already second nature, it can be a huge unlock to keep the experimentation velocity going. Some of the challenges I think that you find once this this is, is working is, okay, we've done an experiment. It was hard. We pushed through. We learned something. And everybody just wants to take a break. And so keeping that velocity going so that you actually end up with Oftentimes, you'll end up with multiple streams for different types of experiments that you can run concurrently. That agile approach to making sure that we're always refining, that we're working on sprints, and that something is always coming up next can be hugely helpful. And just, you know, some of those visual approaches like using a Kanban board lend themselves really well to prioritizing experiments because so often as an analytics leader, you're and you're, you're going to run into a challenge quickly once you get a little bit of momentum about experimentation that everyone's going to want to run their experiment immediately. And there's always going to be some contention. Um, in the marketing space, we do a lot of experiments on geographies and we'll say we'll use half of the country for the test and the other half for the control. You can only do that once at a time, right? And so we have to prioritize these tests. And having an agile framework where I can have a backlog really helps me to communicate with the business to say, what is the most important thing that we need to learn over the next two months? That's at the top of the priority list and maybe some things that feel like, you know, oh, but it's such a good idea. If they don't have that business impact, they can stay on the roadmap, but, but we can deprioritize them and keep the visibility on the backlog. Hmm. And now, now that we're talking about it, uh, I'm just thinking what a good brand, by the way, to have that you are the learning agenda owner, you know, because even data analytics, it's about learning about the business, what's happening in the business, learn about our customers, learn about our internal processes, learning to make better decisions. And it kind of puts your stakeholders in the right spot for you to embrace data analytics as well. So it's kind of like a, it's like a sleight of hand almost in a positive way that, hey, what's, what's on the learning agenda? You know, let's, let's prioritize learning the right things. What do we want to learn as an organization moving forward? It's a great kind of narrative anchor for you as well. And I just thought about it as we're uh, uh, talking through it. Um, you mentioned experimentation velocity. Uh, I can just talk a little bit about that. Like, well, what is this experimentation velocity? I think, you know, for me, once you've got a couple of experiments, the most important thing is to try to continue to grow the impact of those experiments on the business. And, you know, there are a couple of different ways you can go around growing impact. One of them is to run lots of experiments and to keep that velocity going really high. And that lends itself really well to a lot of those online tech companies where your ability to come up with a new um, version of a treatment can happen in days. So if, if that suits your, your business model well, by all means, you know, take a focus towards many small experiments. And a lot of the online uh, courses and examples you'll find about experimentation are all, you know, very much 
lend themselves towards high velocity, lots of small learnings, um, you know, online approach. I think that you have to balance that though. That might not be the best approach for your business. It may be that actually some really large impact, um, but fewer experiments may end up um, drive, driving more value for your business. And so I think it's an important piece for you as an analytics leader to weigh, you know, certainly with some at an executive level, what makes most sense for your business? And so one of the ways I think about it is, where have you been kind of stuck as a business? Uh, oftentimes I ask people to think about like, what are some of those bad meetings you've been to as an analytics leader where you felt like sometimes the loudest voice in the room wins, we weren't really necessarily using data to drive decision making, and you just kind of have a bad feeling in your stomach about going and you go, God, you know, like, I just don't feel like we came to a great decision there. If that keeps happening, those might be right for experimentation. And, and what may end up happening there is not super high velocity, small experiments. It may be slower, but bigger impact experiments that help you really get over some of those hurdles where your business has been, you know, driven based off of theories and, and not testing hypotheses. Yeah, I love it because again, I'm always looking for these opportunities to shine in communication in data analytics. And this is so cool. So you can identify kind of like an experimentation hotspot opportunity by gauging, okay, is there a tension there where you can kind of see when people are banging their heads against each other, but with no progress. And here, if you have the right frame of reference in this case, for example, is there a good hypothesis there that I can propose? Something simple, something low risk, but that could actually move the needle there and, and, and just change the status quo because the status quo is being stuck and it causes friction. So I just imagine, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, in a situation like this, if you could come in that, oh, very interesting. How about we, we try this? Because that's an easy ask and it's really hard to say no to, right? So the person who would say no would need to expose the fact that they are entrenched. You know, so it's almost like you can get things going like that. Do I have the right idea? Absolutely. And I think it's a way that as an analytics leader, you could really also show empathy and use empathy to drive business results. You know, I think about are there opportunities there when the business is stuck to actually elevate some quiet contributors, some folks that you, you know, even on your one on ones are doing, um, you know, some really insightful work or using data to form a hypothesis and they're just not able to get that with as much exposure, as well as to just diversify the inputs uh, that are coming into some of your planning and some of your big bets. And so, you know, being able to, to work with those um, partners who might not always get a say and, and be able to propose it as a test, you as an analytics leader not only are going to be able um, to demonstrate some of that credibility, but you're bringing more voices um, into the conversation who might have uh, a great perspective. And again, now I'm just thinking, I, I always get these uh, uh, insights during the conversation. Uh, we had a great podcast with uh, Brian Bolter, um, the VP of um, Technology and Analytics at GNJ Pepsi. And Brian attended actually a masterclass before your cohorts. I don't think you guys have been the same one. And Brian was great. He has, an, has a background in Lean Six Sigma, so continuous improvement. And we talked a lot about creating that camaraderie with your business partners. And I'm just thinking that what a great opportunity to have this shared project. And it has a beginning, it has an end, has kind of has its own drama, its own revelations, it's low stakes, it's short, but it's a great way to just pose it. If you create the right environment for it, then there's no reason why you should not try these things. And and again, just really create that partnership in the business through these small experiments. So I love that. And as you said, at the same time, it's a great way to diversify input as well and then elevate those contributors who might be a little bit in the background usually and maybe muffle some of those uh, you know loud voices that sometimes you know uh, need to be maybe uh, tuned down a little bit. I was thinking about that when I was talking to somebody who had left a culture of experimentation and what would I miss? And I think one of the things I would really miss without being able to run experiments every day is certainly that camaraderie and some of the structure it gives your cadences as an analytics team. 
because um, I think we all know what uh, some of those big, busy, high impact periods look like. In the travel business, it was the beginning of COVID. Everybody comes together. Or we all are super focused on one, you know, business goal, and it build great camaraderie and get great business results. You know, at, at Miro, we went through a period of huge hyper growth, and it was so exciting. And analysts knew that their work was driving uh, value every day. And when those periods end, and you get to a bit of a lull, it can be really hard, I think, for analysts to also structure their cadences. So that you're getting some of those wins, you're getting that camaraderie, and and yet you're not maxing out and kind of getting close to burning out. And so that's one of the benefits, I think, of uh, building out this experimentation approach for an analytics team is that you can get some of that focus with your stakeholders and some of that excitement without necessarily burning out. It's not an always on approach. You've got the experiment, you call it, and you're going to do the analysis, then we'll move on to the next one. That's a great point because uh, it's it's so common that you start something that's excitement, everyone is kind of galvanized, but then if, it's, if it takes too long, it kind of fizzles out and it turns into a letdown. But that's a great way to look at it. It's like it, it can, experimentation can become the heartbeat of the uh, of the data science team, or it can be be, be the I know, the rhythm of the war drums, whatever you whatever you prefer, whatever whatever narrative you uh, you like, but it's the same is the same kind of outcome. It, it it gives that you know beat of working together, trying things, learning, reflecting, and then maybe 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 I don't know the next step in your playbook, but then what happens once you are doing these experiments and you have built this velocity? What is the next next step? For an analytics team, I think the next step is really crucial. I think about this as how do I democratize experimentation? And so how do I set up the fundamentals so that more people can independently run more experiments throughout the entire business and then position the analytics team um, to play to our strengths? And so the democratize step for me is really around how can I build out repeatable support structures that let anyone within the business start to set up their own experimentation program. Um, and the tools aren't any different than any other kind of analytics program. Um, I actually found office hours to be hugely helpful. This gets back to that idea of bringing in more voices to build out a hypothesis. That can be a really low stakes space where you're saying, hey, I'll be here every week if you have questions about experiments or you want to look at, you know, you know, just you're at the ideation phase, particularly as you start to refine a hypothesis. I mean, to me, it can take weeks to get to a hypothesis. And that can be someone disappointing for teams who are like, let's go, let's get going. I want to run my experiment. Um, but in that office hour setup, you can say, that's a great idea. Let's play this out. So what you're interested in is this outcome. And start to think about what are some of the sources of bias? What are some of the conflating factors? What are the ways that you're not going to be able to get a clean read? And keep refining and refining and in a really kind of safe space for folks who maybe are intimidated by online statistical significance calculators, right? It can, you can, some of that statistics anxiety shows up in funny ways when you start talking about experimentation. You know, the other piece for me about democratizing experiments was actually a big surprise to me. It was how important it was to have templates that were visual templates that helped set up what is a what experiment are we going to run and commit to it, and then use the same template for our output to call that experiment. And this was so important for the credibility side. Because it is so tempting when you're halfway through an experiment and you can see if you're peaking too early that it's probably not going the right way to start to shift that hypothesis. And so locking in in a real public way, this is where I wrote down my hypothesis. This was the information I used to build. It's really kind of like a business case template. This is the data that I used to support the hypothesis. And win or lose, this was a, you know, this was a valid setup. Then being able to add in a step where the analytics team can really help with the statistics to do some power analysis, you know, regardless of what statistical approaches you're going to take, you have to be able to, to size how long are we going to wait 
before we call this one way or another, before you run this test. And then to have consistent output in a way that people can start to compare experiment to experiment, learning to learning over time was a huge unlock for us. We found at the beginning when everybody presented their experiments in different ways, it was extraordinarily hard for business leaders to be able to make comparisons. Is this a big experiment? Was this a big win? Was this a little win? And an analytics team that can come in and provide that consistency across the whole business with the templates and the examples w- was just really important to continuing building out this culture of experimentation. So, and we found the same, by the way. And you know, it just happens to be the case that you work at Miro, but. I mean, genuinely, this is not, no like planned plug or anything, but but Miro is great. But why I I enjoyed working with it is because I'm just an absolute sucker for something that's intuitive and well designed, and it has like a, a real utility. You know, I guess you can use multiple platforms for this, starting from a Google Sheet to even Excel or you know one of the usual suspects with project management, Asana, Upwork, Notion. You know we're actually using Notion uh, uh, too. But you know Miro for for me is just that like go to place for visual stuff. It's like this kind of uh, I can project what's in my head onto something intuitively and easily. So um, it has it has real utility. Quick question um, on that. Uh, Do you have any best practices on getting the team engaged with a new tool? So let's say if you introduce something like this, whether it's Miro or whatever else, uh, do you have any any advice on how to streamline that process? I think, you know, when it comes to displaying your hypothesis and your results, definitely meet the business where they're at already. You know, how are they presenting a QBR? How can you interject experimentation into one of their existing Uh, cadences. And so whether it's a sales QBR or a monthly marketing review, I just meet them wherever they are and try not to focus too much uh, on that type of tooling. The place where I think that you can, you know, start to get some big value out of new tooling is really picking one way of doing power calculations and sizing. And this is a place where the last 10 years is just, we've made huge strides and getting all of this stuff online and free in a way that's really high quality. And so I, I don't think 10 years ago, I would have recommended like just Google online test sizing calculators, but we've come a long way. And so, you know, I would encourage from an analytics perspective, maybe brush up on some of that stats. There's a ton of great open online courses um, just on basic AB testing. And then pick a tool and just stick with it. Um, even if it's just a free online tool, the most important part to me is consistency. Hmm, yeah, and uh, even in that uh, uh, course with uh, Matt from uh, the, the XPayPal guy, uh, is, what is the best tool? And then is, is it Notion? Is it uh, uh, is it Miro? Is it Asana? And then the answer is the tool. The best tool is the, the tool that you're actually going to use. And I think you guys just happen to be really good at that user experience that will uh, be a catalyst for that usability. So, okay, now we have the velocity. Uh, We're rolling. We have the office hours so people can freely propose these ideas that can be then turned into a hypothesis. So what's next? I think the, the last step for me is really to mature this culture and stake your claim as an analytics team to really where your strengths line up. Um, I'd encourage you to think about, you know, where are you going to save some space for the analytics team to shine? Um, There are two ways that that I think analytics is uniquely well suited here. And it's really around new types of experiments and the biggest biggest bets for the business. And so, you know, my I don't think you may get too complicated, but a rule of thumb is if you're in the business and you're doing something where you're experimenting on either splitting people or traffic or accounts totally differently, or you want a completely different setup, bring in the analytics team as a consultant. But also, even if it's an experiment that we've run a bunch of times, if this is the next big bet for the business, bring in the analytics team and let's make sure we add additional rigor in ways that we wouldn't necessarily for small bets. Some of the ways that I think about that is particularly something like pricing. 
pricing experiments can be really powerful, but extraordinarily complex. So much opportunity for bias and, and some of those um, downstream effects. That's where your analytics team can really provide, I think, added value to say, there are some straightforward experiments. We're happy for you guys to run all by yourself, but on those big bets, bring us in. And then I think the other place that I would keep as an analytics leader is really around impact analysis. So particularly thinking through what does this drive for the business? You can get all of this excitement about experimentation, and it can be so easy for a business to then start moving down to smaller and small, smaller experiments with little smaller and smaller stakes, right? And so pretty soon you're just optimizing on these very small things. And you see this a lot on some of the pioneers, even in online travel, where suddenly you're obsessing, right, about the color of the, the button. To me, the analytics team is a great counterbalance to that tendency, which is, we're going to help provide an understanding of what business value we drove from if it's basis points and conversion, and also be able to keep a check on the additive value of experiments. When you start running experiments on top of experiments, the same people are being exposed to 100 different experiments in an online e-commerce store. It can be really easy to take credit for each one of those. The reality is when as soon as your CFO looks at the bottom line, they're going to see if there's no way you guys actually drove this much value. The analytics team has to be the check there to be able to go from your bottom line, whether it's revenue, and work backwards to experimentation. So those are the two that I would really you know, stake my claim as you mature and iterate is analytics should be doing some of those big bed experiments or the new experiments and really owning how um, you're driving impact analysis and ideally monetary value for the business. Absolutely. And as you uh, um, were talking, I'm also thinking that basically whatever outcomes you had with those experiments, you can just always take that. And again, the storytelling aspect of it is to articulate how to actually either saved you a bunch of time going down the the the, the wrong path, right? Uh, what kind of effort it saved for the company and also how you eliminated all these uh, all these routes that now you have the benefit of knowing that you had to go in a different direction. So um, also with in terms of uh, uh, reflection on these experiments and maybe just a final few words on the workflow uh, itself. So in that heartbeat, of experimentation, like um, how are you guys leveraging that time and the space to reflect on these experiments strictly apart from the fact that, okay, we're, we're analyzing the impact. Are there some other benefits to that space of reflection? Definitely. And I think that this is where analytics can be a, a great counterbalance to the rest of, of the business to be able to say, where is the meta-analysis on all of these experiments? What did we learn when you take all of these experiments together? And what types of experiments were most valuable? Um, sometimes it can be useful to kind of count up how, what was your velocity. It depends on, on the team and if, if you're going to motivate them the right way. Um, but I think it's also around, you know, um, providing a, a bit of a credibility check as you look backwards. And so I'd say at least quarterly, you need to be looking as an analytics team against all of the experiments you ran and making sure you've got that uh, high level of validity. And this is where some of your ICs might really start to shine, where some of your analysts on the team say, oh, actually, I loved uh, probability and statistics. I want to dig in um, there is so much information out there um, to help you build this by yourself. Um, and so really, how can you look back on your experiments and say, actually, we need a new statistical approach. I mean, a Bayesian versus frequentist debate can keep you occupied uh, for months. But without having that kind of meta-analysis and that reflection on how well your experimentation program is going, um, I, I think you can kind of get lost in the weeds. Even at Expedia, the heads of experimentation would meet annually amongst all of the different brands and kind of compare best practices. 
think that's another way that you as an analytics leader can kind of, without exposing too much of the special sauce, really kind of benchmark how are we doing against, um, you know, similar companies and make sure you're bringing in um, some great best practices. Absolutely. And uh, actually just today, um, um, we had a conversation with uh, uh, Maddie Wand, uh, who's the VP of data at uh, Fanatics Betting and Gaming. Just today, I uh, published like her short piece on storytelling, and she talks exactly about that, of how you can you know, turn these into narratives that also kind of unify everyone around the, the, the same mission. And I think it's a great addition here that with these experiments, you have additional ammunition for that. So that's great, Kate. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your wisdom on experimentation. And maybe just as a roundup, um, if you reflect and you wanted to give advice to aspiring leaders and either connected or maybe remotely connected to the culture of experimentation, what would be your final words of advice? Maybe also as a, as a summary of what we spoke about. Definitely. I think that I actually would encourage you as an analytics leader to, to even think about what does a more fun work day look like for you? I mean, experimentation is fun. It makes going to work more fun. It makes analytics more fun. And so think back to kind of where could I take some of these pain points in my dealings with business leaders, in my dealings with finance, in my dealings with prickly stakeholders, and I could de-risk some of that and also inject basically some more joy into my everyday workday. That's the space where a culture of experimentation can help you really thrive. So, you know, I'd encourage you to to look at what a better daily work could be. And then also just, you know, where are places that you think your corporate culture could benefit from more voices in the discussion? You know, it's a it's a common issue. Distributed work makes it even more challenging. And bringing people together towards a shared purpose of building out a long term learning agenda and experimentation roadmap can really help you get over some of those uh, hurdles to implementing a growth mindset and you know building out um, you know more voices at the table. And it's one of those uh, things like, oh, make make work more fun. Very, very useful, <laughs> like incredibly useful, especially for engagement, as I said, especially in the virtual workspace, uh, where again, you need to take advantage of every opportunity that you have to bring uh, people on the same page, work towards the, uh, the same goal. So uh, this was fantastic. Thank you so much, Kate, again, for your insights. And we look forward to working with you. Well, uh, you know, some of the listeners will be able to meet you in Austin later this year. Well, unfortunately, the, the, there are no more spaces on that. So if you're listening, you probably, I mean, by the time this hits, we might have already had the session. I'm not even sure, depending on, on our backlog. But uh, yeah, we look forward to meeting you in person in Austin, your, your hometown. All right. Thanks so much for the time. Bye.